Welcome back to History Class with Dr. W and our continuing study of the year 1968. In our previous lecture, we examined the presidency of John F. Kennedy and some of the background events leading towards 1968 in the early 1960s. In this lecture, we'll take a closer look at Kennedy's successor, Lyndon Johnson, and the years of the mid-1960s. Johnson assumed the presidency with an optimistic vision for the nation. He sought to continue and expand the vision of Kennedy, combined with his unique political skill to get things done. After his re-election in 1964, Johnson launched the most aggressive legislative initiative since the New Deal, the so-called Great Society, proposing over 200 major pieces of legislation and passing 181 of them through Congress. His record of reform approached that of FDR. And yet, as we'll see, his presidency was beset by a number of issues, both on the home front and internationally. Johnson is a captivating historical figure, and one who has drawn a great deal of attention from scholars. He was born in 1908 in rural Texas, raised in poverty in the so-called Jim Crow South. His early career and education were modest. He began his career as a school teacher, eventually moving to Washington, D.C. in the midst of the Great Depression and working as a clerk in the FDR administration. He gradually worked his way up through the administration as a minor official, eventually earning election to Congress and serving as a loyal New Dealer during the FDR years. He was elected to several terms, nicknamed Landslide Linden, after the 1948 election, election in which he won his Senate seat by only eight votes. He was a tireless worker who slept only a few hours a day, often staying at the office late into the night and the first one in in the morning. He was a master politician, a skilled negotiator. He frequently was known to work the so-called Johnson treatment, in which he would lean into people's faces and intimidate them. He simply would not accept no for an answer. He tried for the Democratic presidential nomination in 1960, only to lose out to John F. Kennedy. As a consolation prize, he was chosen for the vice presidency. And, of course, he assumed the presidency when Kennedy was assassinated. A greater contrast with the graceful and elegant Camelot days can scarcely be imagined. Lyndon Johnson was crude, not very likable. He belched, scratched himself, and swam naked in the White House pool. He also had a way of bending the truth. He wasn't above telling small lies to get his way. In the case of Vietnam, as we'll discuss much more later, small lies led to bigger lies, leading eventually to the so-called credibility gap that plays such a huge role in 1968. He exaggerated the threat of the Gulf of Tonkin incident and made promises to congressmen that he later broke. There came to be a saying around Washington, how do you know when he's telling the truth? When he scratches his head, rubs his chin, or knits his brow, he's telling the truth. When he begins to move his lips, he's lying. In the legislation. After Kennedy's assassination, Lyndon Johnson convinced the nation and Congress to honor his memory by fulfilling the legislation he had initiated. In February 1964, Congress passed a $10 billion tax reduction which contributed to the economic boom that lasted throughout most of the decade. They also passed further housing legislation and acts such as food stamps and others. In 1964, they passed the Economic Opportunity Act, a $1 billion measure for anti-poverty programs. These included Head Start for preschoolers, the creation of the Job Corps for inner-city youth, and the Community Action Program, which involved the participation of local community members in various anti-poverty programs. In Johnson's presidency, 
From 1963 to 1968, the poverty rate fell from 20% to 13%. During the same period, the number of recipients on welfare doubled, thus creating a mixed legacy on poverty. Lyndon Johnson had grand ambitions, but achieved limited gains. As one historian has written, perhaps no government programs in modern American history promised so much more than it delivered. By the late 1960s, urban rioting was rampant. There were major riots across the country. The perception that the poor brought trouble upon themselves and were not willing to work to help themselves. In 1969, polls showed that 84% of Americans agreed with this statement. There are too many people receiving welfare who ought to be working. These critiques and others led to some doubt that Johnson could win re-election in 1964. The expansion of the government under Kennedy and Lyndon Johnson led to a conservative backlash. Conservatives united in opposition to big government and expansion of welfare measures. They argued for a victory over communism rather than coexistence. In 1964, Barry Goldwater rose to the forefront of this conservative movement to win the Republican nomination for president. Goldwater was a senator from Arizona. Goldwater and the conservatives also hoped to benefit from the growing discontent of the civil rights movement. They appealed to white Southern voters, while Johnson was virtually conceded the black vote that had gone to Kennedy in the 1960 presidential election. But Goldwater strayed to the extreme. Johnson and others depicted him as a dangerous reactionary. At times, he advocated nuking Cuba and North Vietnam if necessary and thus he alienated the vital center of America's voting body. Lyndon Johnson, riding both the memory of John F. Kennedy and his own Great Society agenda, swept to a landslide of Rooseveltian proportions, 61% of the popular vote, and a victory of 486 to 52 in the Electoral College in the 1964 election. Goldwater won only a handful of southern states and his home state of Arizona. Goldwater lost the election, but he had begun to rally support behind a conservative agenda that would pay dividends later, most notably in the election of 1968, and even more tellingly in the 1980 election of Ronald Reagan's. Frustration with big government, with the credibility gap, with the growth of welfare and government aid, with civil rights and other liberal aims, would open the door for Richard Nixon in 1968. Following his sweeping landslide victory in 1964, Lyndon Johnson initiated the so-called Great Society. Over the first six months of 1965, Johnson and Congress swept through a series of acts, a period of legislative activity second only to the New Deal in the number and significance of acts passed. For our purposes here, I have time to mention only a few, but there were dozens and dozens passed during this period. Examples included Medicare, which provided medical assistance for those on Social Security. The Elementary and Secondary Education Act of 1965, a $1 billion measure providing textbooks, libraries, and educational aid for the poor. The Immigration Act of 1965, which replaced the National Origins Act of 1924, which had created quotas with family preference. This opened the door for greatly expanded Hispanic and Asian immigration. The Wilderness Act of 1964 which created some 9 million acres of national forest, and the Wild and Scenic Rivers Act of 1968 to protect rivers as well. And there were dozens of other acts passed during this period. Also during these years, the Supreme Court contributed to the liberal movement. John F. Kennedy appointed two liberal justices that gave the liberals a majority which lasted throughout the Lyndon Johnson presidency. In 
The Chief Justice was Earl Warren, and the so-called Warren Court of the 1960s brought down dozens of key acts across all manner of social issues. These included disallowing the poll tax and other discriminatory practices at the polls. In 1967, a decision upheld the right to interracial marriage. A 1962 decision struck down mandatory school prayer. 1965 acts upheld abortion as a women's right to privacy. In 1964, it was deemed that states could not ban sexually explicit material unless, quote, it is found to be utterly without redeeming social value, a slippery slope that eventually allowed almost anything. In 1963, the court mandated court-appointed attorneys for those who could not afford one, and in 1964 mandated that accused criminals be allowed to see a lawyer. These culminated in 1966 with the so-called Miranda Rights, a variety of rights granted to suspects and criminals, and ultimately informing criminals of their right to remain silent and have an attorney present. With these and many other acts, some worried that the courts were becoming too powerful, were creating legislation rather than simply arbitrating it, and were empowering dangerous criminals. Nonetheless, these and many other decisions laid the groundwork for many of the central issues that continue to confront our society even today. It's also during those years of the mid-1960s that the so-called baby boom generation became a major force in American culture. The baby boomers were reaching their high school and college years, and by 1965, 41% of Americans were under the age of 20. It's during this era that colleges became the seedbed of protest, a factor we'll talk much more about in 1968. By the early 1960s, the message of the beat poets of the 50s had spread. Anti-materialism, anti-militarization. This became the backbone of the so-called counterculture movement. They rejected the tenets of modern industrial society, materialism, self-denial, work ethic, and sexual repression. Instead, the counterculture espoused a so-called higher consciousness, drug use, sexual freedom, relaxed clothing and appearance, and so on. This was the age of sex, drugs, and rock and roll. Timothy Leary became the prophet of the drug culture. A Harvard psychologist, he preached the wonders of magic mushrooms and LSD. Tune in, turn on, drop out, he preached. LSD was widely available on college campuses throughout the country, and marijuana was also very popular. This was also the era of sexual expression and free love which were becoming popular in these years. The music as well was becoming more sexually explicit. Studying the Beatles alone can create a study in the, the culture of the 1960s. Analyzing the changing lyrics from 1964's I Want to Hold Your Hand to the more explicit lyrics of the later 60s. Sexual images and pornography was becoming more widespread on television, in movies, and throughout American society. New methods of birth control and the widespread use of the pill contributed to heightened sexual activity. By 1970, some 10 million women were using the pill. Music and rock and roll in these years epitomized the counterculture. In the early 60s, Bob Dylan, the acoustic guitar, the harmonica, poetic and sometimes controversial lyrics began shifting the tones of American popular music. In 1963, the freewheeling Bob Dylan was the number one album, and songs like Blowin' in the Wind called for political change. By 1964, the music was dominated by the British invasion, 
headed by the Beatles. In 1964, they had their epic appearance on The Ed Sullivan Show. Their early albums and appearance were relatively wholesome. By 1967, Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band, one of the most important albums of all time, exerted a great influence in American society. The influence of psychedelic drugs was readily apparent in their music, and millions of American youth followed them. Even more explicit groups like the Rolling Stones and the Who were following not far behind. But I'm getting ahead of myself. We'll talk more about all of those developments when we get to the year 1968 itself. <laughs> 